So, my name's Clifford Ages. Um, I'm a senior thrust officer flying 787s around the world. So, last week I was in San Jose. Next week I'm off to Baltimore. The week after that I'm off to India. So, I get around the world, um, uh, all over the place. As I say, I'm the 787 fleet. So, but having said that, I know I said I sometimes do these talks. Normally, the talks that I give are behind a bulletproof door, and I'm facing that way, and I can't see the whites of your eyes. So, if I seem nervous, a bit worried is because I can actually see your faces and see the looks in your faces. So uh, I'm not the best of public speakers. I'm trying. Um, I've listened to Dylan Beattie saying, you know, more people should do speaking at these conferences, which is why I'm here. It's his fault. Um, so make a fool of myself. It's me making a fool of myself, not any company I work for. But me, uh, as I've said, my my day-to-day -day job is that of an airline pilot for a UK major airline. My passions, coding, electronics, IoT, I seem to do a lot more of that now. Um, and learning new things. I love learning, which is why I'm here at NDC. Um, and I like supporting others. If I can see that I can help someone make themselves better, or you know, if they're struggling, I like to step in and help out. I like cycling, road and mountain biking, and family, wife, three boys, two dogs. Um, but you can see my passions are coding and electronics and things, but the day job is the is the, the airline and flying planes, which gives me a unique, as a freelance developer, advantage over other freelance developers. I don't have to worry when the next project's coming in because the day job pays the bills, puts food in the fridge and the roof over the family's head. And the, the stuff that comes in from development means I can follow other passions, like you know, learn new things and do courses, come to places like this. That's my office. So uh, that's the 787 flight deck. You can see we've got head-up displays, so, uh, yeah, a bit like Top Gun. Uh, and I sit in the right-hand seat, so I'm a senior first officer. The captain sits in the left-hand seat. And I'm always asked this after everyone comes, oh, why well, you got the little cut in your seat? Is it? It's so the control cone can come back, so you can pull it back towards you if you need to do uh, a pull-up um, manoeuvre, i.e. you're flying towards a mountain or something, which is never good. So, um, aircraft, the Dash 8 aircraft. I delivered one of our Dash 8 aircraft from Seattle, um, three years ago, and uh, it had a, a, a bill price of $250 million. Um, that is just a bit of paper we give to HMRC. The actual real price is something that the airline and, uh, and Boeing dream up, and it's a bit like your car. If you want mud flaps, it's going to cost you. Um, the seat that I sit in, that one there, I found out is about eighty to 90000 just for the seat. It does nothing special. It's electric, but it doesn't remember me. As, uh, as the driver. Um, I have to position it every day I go to work. Office view. So we get some kind of cool views. This is a picture I took uh, a while ago. Uh, we were racing these guys across the Atlantic um, overnight, uh, coming back from the US. They thought they'd won because they were in front of us, but we were lower, and the lowest aircraft always get priority because they're not allowed to descend. It's like an imaginary 10-mile envelope around the aircraft. So they're not allowed to come into that, so we beat them into Heathrow. <laughs> not that we race. On the left is a, it's called St. Elmo's Fire, as it says in the text below, if you've already read it. Um, it's wonderful, you see all these static discharge on the main windows as you're flying along, which is great, and it looks really pretty. Um, that wasn't me, by the way. Um, that's just a picture I found on airliners.net. Um, so you're looking at it, and you're kind of, ah, oh, look at that, it's really nice. And then you think, ah, oh, bugger, we're about to get hit by lightning because that's what generally happens. You see this in Elmo's fire, and then bang, a big bolt of lightning hits the aircraft. So, um, yeah, it's nice to see. You have to think through what's going to happen. So just some facts about the aircraft to fly. Um, total on board power is what, nearly uh, what 1.45 megawatts. It's enough to power about 200 ohms, even with all the Wi-Fi and tech that kids have these days. Um, so five times more power than conventional airliners. So it's quite a lot of power, really, but that's because you've all got your IFE kit, you want to plug your laptops in. Um, everything on board the aircraft is electric. Even the air you breathe has not been through the engines. It's been compressed by electric compressors um, that sit in the rear of the aircraft. So you know, there's no chance of you getting oil ingestion from the engines into the cabin air supply. The 787 cockpit has been taken by Lockheed Martin and Boeing, and they've adapted it a little to fit on the Orion spacecraft. In space. I'm really hoping they're going to let me have a go. I'm not sure, but uh, we'll see. 
Windows, someone said they've, they've been on the 7 Who's been on the 787? Who's flown on one? Yes, yeah, so you've seen all the big windows and they dim. It's kind of cool. And the cabin lights change colours and we can dim them and do sunrise. So instead of the cabin crew just turning the lights on, you hold on, like this. And the lights come up over a period of about 30 minutes. So it naturally brings you out of sleep. There's another reason why when you get off a 787 flight, you feel a bit better, a bit more refreshed, because you haven't been jolted awake. In fact, they bang the pots and sort of cups around to wake you up anyway, but hey. Flies at Mach 8.5, 650 miles an hour. That's our normal cruise speeds. I've had it out to Mach 9.0 to meet an ocean entry point. Um, it can go a touch faster. Um, the other day I was coming back from, um, uh, where was it was coming back from? It was from San Jose. It was crossing, it was about 180 mile an hour jet stream we, we took advantage of. And even flying the aircraft as slow as it will fly, kind of dragging along the sky, because otherwise you get to Heathrow before it opens. Um, we had a ground speed of just over 750 miles an hour, which is kind of Mach 1.04, somewhere around there, because, uh, um, sorry, speed of sound is Mach 1 at sea level. At the altitude we were at, it's about Mach 1.104 if we was at sea level, so quite quick. And as I mentioned earlier, when someone asked, we have the smooth ride technology on the wings and the tail of the aircraft. So the angle of attack probes at the very front of the plane, so you imagine the very nose kind of the plane, there's two angle of attack probes, one each side. They sense the movement of the air. So they sense the air that the plane flying through is, is trending up. They calculate that, calculate the opposite of that, tell the tail plane, which is you know, 60 meters behind it, to put the nose down. So by the time the air reaches the tail plane, which is affecting the pitch of the aircraft, it's already nulled out, that movement. If you think you're doing 650 mile an hour, that 60 meters happens pretty quick. So over at Honeywell Systems, right, that bit of code is pretty good, I think. Just wish they'd fix a few other things, It'd be nice. So on the 787, it took me a while to find out from Boeing engineers and um, the airline engineers how many computers on board. And we basically took this as any computer that runs code that's been written for that computer. So things like your window blinds, there's a little microcontroller in there, which is when you push the buttons to open and close the windows, or the cabin crew can tell the window to be fully open and fully closed from the main console. There's a little microcontroller in there that carries it. So that's, we counted that as a, as a computer. So we've got thousands on the 787. A lot of computers make trillions of decisions every second, but it's us fleshy bits that sit at the front that make the ultimate decisions when it all goes a bit wrong. So how do we work out what to do? Well, we have a little framework that we use, which is what I'm going to talk about today. We all love frameworks, we're all developers, we're like, you know, the new JavaScript framework. This, is, this one's a bit different. This is, yeah, a bit more life and death than this. Well, I don't know JavaScript these days. But, yeah. So this little video here, if you watch this. Now, before we take off, we do any takeoff anywhere in the world, we always do a pilot briefing. What's the weather doing? What state is the aircraft in? Are we carrying any defects with the aircraft? Because we're allowed to carry some defects. We've got so much redundancy. So many computers, we're allowed to, you know, one may not be working, but we can carry on. We can get back to, to home base. Um, we always brief the departure. When we take off, we're going to turn left, we're going to do this, climb to altitude, and et cetera, et cetera. And we always brief the what if. What if the left engine goes boom as we take off? What if the cabin starts filling with smoke? when we get to our initial um, climb altitude of 6,000 feet to the you know, We always talk about the what is. What will we do? The reason we talk about it on the ground, with a cup of tea, nice and relaxed, yeah, when we've got a spare 10 minutes, still waiting for the, uh, the passengers to board and the bags to be loaded, is such that when we do have that situation, when we're airborne, we can calmly, we talked about this on the ground, we've already made a decision what we're going to do. Is it any different to what we talked about on the ground? Yes or no? And we can calmly go through our framework without being panicked, because we've already briefed what we're going to do. These guys here obviously did this um, textbook work, and hopefully it should play. I'm not sure if any of you remember this, but there's Tweety Birds. Straight down the right engine. Engine surging away. Do you see there? They've, they've got an airborne, had a bird down engine. They weren't expecting that when they got up in the morning, you know, having their bowl of porridge, having their cup of coffee. 
but that's what they were presented with. They briefed on the grounds, which is why he could say what their intentions were, because they already briefed it on the grounds. They already talked about it. This is what we're going to do. We're having engine failure. We'll carry on with the SID, go to Wallasey, climb main chain 6,000. Air track and control come back, give them just the bare information they needed to know. All runways are available, and this is the wind. Don't need to know anything else. Shut up, leave me alone. That's what the air track control in the UK are trained to do, which is awesome. Other parts of the world, they'll start talking to you and telling you all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, these guys went round, they dumped some fuel, spent about 20, 30 minutes in the air, come back, nice landing, taxi over for engineering, get the aircraft over, I think we broke it. And uh, the Pashas got another plane and off they went on their, uh, on their holiday. Now on the next slide, I added on the train the other day, um, because it occurred to me, looking at Twitter and you know, my friends that follow me that are aviation as well, that in January, nine years ago, and January, ten years ago, these two incidents happened. So I'm sure you remember seeing all over the news, no matter where you were in the world, you would have seen it. Chelsea Sullenberger ditching the aircraft in the Hudson, hitting geese, taking off out of LaGuardia. And um, Pete Burkill and the guys, and I forgot his name, I keep forgetting his name, um, John Coward, that's it, uh, having the 038 incident at Heathrow. Now, US Airways flights took off hit the geese at about 1,500 feet. They were told lots of things. You listen to the, um, the audio tape uh, from air track control, they were given loads and loads of instructions, far too much. Um, and when they were asking, can we do this, can we do that, it's like, you know, negative, and there's lots of, you can't do that um, because I've got an aircraft over here. In the UK, they, they, the air track control are brilliant. They will, they will sort the dots out on the radar and get rid of them. And you can do what you want to do and they'll worry about that side. So they ended up coming around. They couldn't make another runway. They couldn't get back because they had dual engine failure. So they ended up sticking it on the Hudson. Awesome decision. It was fantastic work that day. And you know the only reason the aircraft sank? Because they went through the checklist for ditching. And the last item on the checklist um, is, you know, when you get to 200 feet, you push the ditching button, which closes all the little holes around the bottom of the aircraft, um, which normally is where the air flows out when it comes in from the engines on that aircraft. You guys breathe it, and when you breathe out your, your uh, carbon dioxide, it's all sucked out the back of the aircraft, out to atmosphere. They didn't close that ditch, didn't push the ditching button, which means that little valve at the back of the aircraft was still open, which means it started filling with water, and that's why it sunk. So the manufacturer of that is an Airbus A320. I've now moved that item a little bit higher in the checklist <laughs> to save having to sort of uh, pick aircraft out of the water. These guys here, first they knew of the engine's having a problem, because we do a continuous descent approach into, into Heathrow. First thing new, it's about 700 feet, just shy of two miles from the runway. They're doing 180 mile an hour, so we've got about 50 seconds-ish, give or take a bit, to make a decision of what to do. What's wrong with our plane? What we're going to do? How are we going to resolve it? Captain Pete Burkill made an awesome decision that day and moved the flap lever from flap 30 to flap 25. Flap 25 is still a landing flap, um, but it means that you reduce the drag. So the flaps retracted just enough for them to hop over the fence and the BP petrol goes, it's just here on the A30. Land there, bounce, and then land there, and then skid to a halt. So, yeah, everyone got off, everyone was alive on both aircrafts. So, brilliant decisions. Now again, I'm gonna to talk today about how we make these decisions on the flight deck and what we do. Now you can imagine here, when that happened to them, that happened to them, and the Thompson flap was before. What do you think is the first reaction? Anyone? A Sorry? A Let some swearing be good. You're going to be, oh, fuck. You're going to be like, what the heck is happening? I didn't expect this when I had my coffee this morning. Yeah, we call that our chimp response. Yeah? So we've all got an inner chimp, and the inner chimp rattles the cage and says, oh, get me out of here, I don't like this, I want to go. So we say cage the chimp. So you have an input into the human being. The chimp sees it first, because it's got the low road, um, and the human sees it second. So we say cage the chimp. Sit in your hands, wind your watch, take a deep breath, another swig of a tea or coffee. Don't react. Yeah? Feed the chimp a banana. Do whatever you need to do. Just, just don't react instantly. Because if you do, it'll be a chimp response, which means you know, when you hear a loud bang, you'll jump. That's a naturalistic chimp response. You grab a hot pan, you'll drop it. Yeah? 
Then the human kicks in and says, don't pick up that hot pan. It was hot. It hurt last time. Yeah? So that's the chimp response. The human is the analytical, the thinking, the cognitive function. You see Sir Bradley Wiggins here. It's all kind of, um, you know, when he's doing the, um, the Olympics and the Tour de France, he was talking about the, the, the small gains uh, with uh, David Brasford, wasn't it? And they used a lot of this in their, in their kind of training to make sure you didn't have a chimp response right here. The breakaway is just gone. Right, I must chase them. No, because actually you're going to wear yourself out. Think about it. Is it right to chase them or not? Actually, no, it's not. We'll catch them later. It's fine. We've got another 40 miles to go. So they did a lot of this kind of training. And this is what we do every six months. I have to hand my license over to the training department, go in the simulator for two days. I did mine week before last. And hopefully, pass the sim check, whatever it is they throw at you. They could throw absolutely anything at you. You have to pass the sim check, they sign your license and give it back to you. Then you can go and fly passengers again. <coughs> you don't pass the sim check, you know, you mess up the engine failure after departure, you get airborne, engine fouls, and you don't handle it within the prescribed parameters. You don't get the signature, you don't get your license back. Now your career's on the line. The roof over the family's head, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of pressure in that. And you could quite happily think of it as being a chimp response and going in the sim and really not happy. Um, but you, know, you get so used to it every six months. I've been doing this for, what, 15 years now, flying planes. It's, it's kind of you know, second nature to go in the sim now and practice my skills. So let's say a type of decision making, we've got naturalistic, that's the, the chimp, that's the drop in the hot pan, hearing a, um, a, a, a loud bang next to you, you know, whatever it is, a, a, a police siren, quite loud, oh, was I speeding? The first thing, you know, you're driving you know, 20 mile an hour in a 50 zone, and the first thing you do is look at your speedo, was I speeding? Well, of course I'm not. Um, but that's your naturalistic response. You've got the analytical, the human, taking a bit of time, being calm, thinking it through, getting a cup of tea. Then you've got your raw base, which is the bit in the middle. You don't have enough time to be analytical. You really don't want to be naturalistic and a chimp involved, but raw base. That'll be where you have a checklist. Yeah? And you go through a checklist or a list of instructions. So say naturalistic, it's pattern matching, you've got lots of time. Prime by experience, so you can train your chimp. That if it sees something, you know, we're not going to do this, we're not going to jump. You know, you can train, which is why, where you hear of um, soldiers coming back from, from war zones and they'll have a loud bang next to them. They won't jump because they're so used to hearing loud bangs of war in whatever war zone it is, it doesn't bother them. Review is really, really, really important. So if you do have a naturalistic bugger jump, yeah, try and calm down, take a deep breath, and get the human involved to review what's going on. Why did I jump? Why did I drop that hot pan? Oh, it was hot, so I'm not going to pick up again. Right, that's a good idea. Humans thinking it through. Takes time, takes effort. You need to calm yourself down first, take a deep breath, before you can get the human involved. And you need to cage a chimp, is what we call it. Feed it a banana. Um, before it takes over, before it gets panicked. And you see this quite often in young children. If something happens, they'll get panicked and start running around and crying and jumping up and down, getting upset. You calm them down, you know, tell them something nice, take their mind off it. And we use a framework called T-DODAR. This is what all the pilots at the airline I work for are trained. Um, and it's taken from NASA, from the Apollo Space Program. Just we've changed some of the, what the letters are and added the T at the front, because NASA didn't have that, which is for time. And a human can think through options. If there's a group of humans, you can get more options. So, you know, it's always good to do these things in groups. That's why there's two pilots at the front, um, sometimes three or four. And as I say, somewhere in the middle is the shortcuts. It's rule-based, it's quick, it's easy. You just follow the checklist. The decisions are intuitive because you've trained them. You've followed that checklist every six months and you do it religiously again and again and again. You know where it is. Uh, someone else has done the thinking, the hard work. You know I said about Chelsea Sullenberger and the uh, ditching button to close little holes? That had been designed by many engineers at Airbus, the legal people who were involved. They got involved again, the legal people that is, after the incident and said, well, let's move that up the checklist so we don't have one of our aircraft sink into the bottom of the Hudson if it ever, ever to happen again. And as I say, shortcuts, your brain's way of helping us. You know, when you, you're coming up to a set of traffic lights, you don't think about, you know, dropping down the gears and applying the brakes because the lights are turning red in front of you. You just do it, don't you? You, know, you just naturally do it without thinking. That's the wall base and the, the point of training your chimp. 
but the chimp is involved, it can take over, you have to be, just be mindful of that happening. So, this is me flying across the Atlantic, I've been up all night, it's about four o'clock in the morning, the sun's just rising, it's in the summer. Um, decisions that me as a pilot have to make, most of them are, you know, just about the day's journey. I pulled out five that have happened to me in my 15 year career so far. There are many others, but I didn't want to put them on a slide and scare you all off. Um, but stop by lightning, do you think that's a chimp response? A human response or all base response? Who thinks chimp? Anyone? Two people, three, four, some hands. Who thinks it's wall based? A few more hands, okay. Who thinks it's, it's the analytical human getting involved? Nobody, okay. Well, I can tell you for now, the lightning struck the, the, the last time this happened, which is why I put it up there, um, struck just there as I was sitting in the seat. It was a chimp response. There was lots of swearing. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, God. <laughs> but then, training kicked in. I took a deep breath, calm. Captain was wetting himself with laughter. He thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, he took control of the aircraft. He could see that I'd just been kind of shocked by what had happened. So he was like, I have control, which is fantastic. That's the training kicking in. I took a deep breath. I was like, I'll sod off you. And everything else. And then we dealt with the situation. You know, I've lost count how many times I've been struck by lightning. It's, I'm getting off fingers. If you're ever in an aircraft that's struck by lightning, don't worry. The plane's designed to do it. It's a Faraday's cage. The lightning goes around the outside of the airframe. It doesn't go down the centre. If you think you've seen something go down there, our way. It's not. It's the fact the lightning's gone on the outside and your eyes are picked up through the windows. So it feels as if it's come towards you or just to the left of you or just to the right of you. Um, yeah, no aircraft has ever been brought down by lightning. Engine surge, top of climb. Who thinks that's when you say, see those guys that had it out of Manchester when the engine was going bang, 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 bang. Um, that's when the internals of the engine have been damaged and it's, the air's go, airflow's going the wrong way through the engine. So it keeps banging, misfiring, basically just like an engine in a car. Top of climb, so we just get in there. Clamco had just handed our breakfast. We just had our first forkful of food. Bang, and the aircraft swinging around the sky. And do you think that's a chimp response? A few hands. Human response? Analytical? Uh, sorry, wall based? A lot more hands. Yeah, it was actually. First response was bugger. You know, <laughs> put a plate of food on the floor or on the tray table next to us. And, uh, and yeah, we wall base, got an engine surge, went through the checklist, what it was to do. After that, it then goes to the analytical phase, the human, right, now what are we going to do? You know, we just shut down this engine, you know, we're just somewhere over, over France, off to Zurich, what are we going to do now? You know, that day, we spoke to uh, our engineering team on the ground, and they said, we'd like you to bring it back, we was going to Zurich, it's a bit hilly there, you don't really want to go there with a single engine, because, well, the hills are quite big. Um, so we went back to, to London, Heathrow. Medical emergency, we just pushed back off stand, literally moved about 20 feet, a call from the cabin crew at the back, um, saying we can see the, cab, the crew at the back of the aircraft giving heart start procedures to a passenger in the aisle way. That's all I know, I'll get back to you. So that's all you know. Do you think that's chimp response? Wall based? A few, human response? Yeah, it was a human response actually. It's like, oh, okay, um, well, what do you want to do then? And we quickly talked it through, told the ground tug guy to stop pushing the aircraft, pull us back on stand because we want to get medical help as quickly as we can, assuming this person, I mean, if you're doing heart start procedures, it's not good, let's be honest. Um, yeah, we went back on stand, got the paramedics on board, and our crew, we have a, those paddle things, what are they called? The <laughs> DFib, that's it, thank you. They'd done that, and the kit we have tells the crew what to do. So it says charging, charging, standby, standby, shocking, stand back, and it goes through this whole thing, and they're shocked. They did that three times before the paramedics arrived. And the paramedics said that when they arrived, they do the second just for the family to prove that they did it right the first time. And the paramedic said he'd never known anybody to, if the heart start didn't work the first time, never known anyone in all his years' experience for the heart start to work the second time. They did it three times without a weak pulse. So, you know, they're trying to just keep going until the paramedic arrives, even if that's the mid-Atlantic and they've still got four hours of flying time before we can get somewhere to get help. They'll just keep going. Airport closed due to snow. Chimp response? Rule-based? A few hands, yeah. 
the human analytical. Yeah, a few more. It was human analytical. It was a little bit, oh, really, my car's parked there. I want to go home. You know? But other than that, it was, yeah, what we're going to do, where we're going to go, how we're going to sort this out, how we're going to get passengers to where we want to be. Baggage system, failure, early morning departure. This is the exercise that we're going to do at the end, so if you pay attention. Um, this one here, you can answer this at the end of the uh, exercise. So T Dodar, that's what I said we use. I'm going to whiz through it in the interest of time. This is the first one. Oh, clicky thing, stop working. Diagnosis. So diagnose what is it that's wrong, what are we trying to fix? Options, decision, assign, and then finally review. Did we do the right thing? Have we fixed what we're trying to fix? Have we got more time left? Can we do this whole exercise again? So time, how much time do we have? Is it an emergency? Do we have to act quickly? Do we have to rely on our rules and procedures? Get the checklist out. It's an engine failure, a surge. Can we make more time? Is there something we can do to patch the situation, put a sticky plaster over it, make us a bit more time so we can actually think about this properly and come up with a really good answer? Um, we quite often use this thing, have we got time for a cup of tea? We like tea. Um, so if we can push the bing bong button, get the camera crew to bring us a cup of tea, then we've got plenty of time. We can calmly sit, think about it. And if there's time for chalky biscuits as well, really, really good. So the first thing we do, it's trained, it's ingrained in us. If we hear one of the alarms on the aircraft or we hear a bang or something shocks us, one of the things we do, rather than sit on our hands, one of the things we do to feed the chimp is push the stopwatch button. It's just like intuitive. If you used to play me the, 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 the siren, uh, master warning and caution signs from a 787 or any Boeing aircraft, my first response is to do that just because it's you know, ingrained in me. And you always come back to tea to see if things have changed. Because you may have said, oh, we've got 10 minutes, it's fine. You may do something that reduces that 10 minutes down to two minutes. Yeah. Think about when you cut the red wire in a bomb in the movies and it suddenly drops down by a few minutes. It also stands for team. Really, really important to the team exercise. It's not you on your own. It's not you and your colleague that have been given this problem. It's you and everybody around you, your whole department, your company. There could be someone that's seen this before. There could be someone that's got more experience in this than you. Reach out for help. Yeah, give them a call, text message, email. D, diagnosis, what do we think has happened? Discuss this, the, the symptoms. Don't say, right, I think the left engine's failed. You know, discuss the, the, the symptoms. Oh, look at the EGT on the left engine's uh, gone really high, and the, the M1, which is the speed of the, 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 the blade at the front of the aircraft, has, uh, has almost stopped. You know, we felt a big bang and we swung to the left. You know, talk about the symptoms. Agree what the symptoms were. That way you can come to a really good idea as to what the problem is you're trying to fix. Another thing we're trained to do is one of us to talk about the symptoms and we'll agree what the problem was. Well, I think the left engine found it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Why do you think it's not the right engine then? Well, actually, because the right engine, the EGT is a normal M1 gauge is saying about right, the fuel flow is about right. It swung to the left as well, which means the left engine failed, the right engine's carried on pushing, which is why we've gone to the left. Um, okay, yeah, that's, that's good enough reason. Yeah, that works for me. And then agree what you're trying to tackle. Right, left engine failed, we've got to fix that problem. Are you happy? Yes, let's deal with that then. Yeah. And you see we've gone through that quite systematically. We took a bit of time about it. We talked it through as a team. Yeah, you've not just jumped off or all gone off in different directions to solve the problem. I know how to do this and go off and start bashing at your keyboard. Just talk it through, work it out. Yeah. And this isn't the sort of thing you'll go into a meeting room, get the whiteboard, book it out for two hours. We're going to take our time and really sort this diagnosis out. Quick, punchy, get it done. Yeah. Options. This is the sort of thing you quite see sort of people in meeting rooms. Yeah, option generation, that whole kind of you know, brainstorming. We're going to put everything down we can possibly think of. Um, so brainstorm the options. Give me another option. If the room's gone quiet, you know, pick someone out. If you're in the meeting room, pick someone out. Yeah, give me another option. What do you think? You know, I often find when I've done this, we, uh, as I say, I've done these talks um, in the medical profession with doctors and nurses. You'll often find there'll be a junior doctor or a junior nurse at the back of the room quiet and meek and sitting there doing nothing. I pick them out and, ask, and they've normally got the right answer and it's perfect. I've seen this many, many times where it's normally the quiet person sitting at the back that's got the correct answer or got the gem of an idea. So pick them out. If you're the team lead and you're standing at the front just kind of leading this, then pick them out. Ask them. What do you think? 
No such thing as a, ver uh, a silly idea, verbalise everything. Your idea, which may seem silly, let's shut down the right engine. Oh, well, hold on, that's a bit silly, yeah. Um, you know, it might be the seed of an idea for somebody else. It might be the seed for their giant oak of a brilliant idea which solves the problem, fixes it. Don't drag it out. Again, the clock's still ticking. You've started your stopwatch. Take your time. Go through it nice and slowly. Decide. So you decided what the problem was. You've got loads of options now on your whiteboard, you know, in your Slack channel, wherever it is you've, you've decided to make your, your list of ideas. You know, maybe it's just verbal talking between you. Decide what you're going to do. This is what we're going to do to fix this problem. Okay? Once you've decided it, decided it, again, as a team you decide this, it's not the team lead to say, no, we're doing this. Yeah? Because if you're the team lead and you decide and you're saying you're doing this, and the rest of the team have actually decided they want to do X instead of Y, you've lost your team. You're not going to get it done. Yeah, they're going to go back to the desk. Oh, really? He wants us to do this? Oh, no. So do it as a team decision. Make it a team decision. And you'll find if it's a team that's made the decision, a team that's been involved in the decision, a team that's helped generate the options, who get more engagement, they'll go back to the desk, they'll skip back to their desks and be involved in, in sorting this problem out. But the really, really, really important bit is state the decision. Make sure everybody knows what the decision was, including the person sitting tapping away at their emails while you've been making the decision and doing option generation, checking their Twitter feed and stuff. Like, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're gonna, how we're going to do it. And failure to decide is to decide to fail. That comes from NASA. If you don't make a decision, you've already failed. You're not going to solve the problem. If you haven't decided what to do, you can't. You can't solve the problem, can you? So just pick one. doesn't matter what one. If you've got two answers or decisions that look as if they'll both fix the problem, just pick one. doesn't matter which one. If you procrastinate over it, take your time and think, oh, well, I really wish I had that bit of data and it, that'll prove it's that one. Well, like I said earlier, prove it's not that one by going down the other path. And you'll soon know, because you'll soon have you know, a management, customers, clients, whoever it is that you're trying to solve this problem for, screaming and shouting at you, you're doing it wrong. So you'll go back down the path, reset, and go down the correct path. So pick one. A, assign the task. Now this is the first time I've really mentioned the team leader. This is the bit the team leader does. Yeah, and the idea of the team leader doing this is the fact that they know the strengths and weaknesses of their team. They know who's best at doing the, you know, whatever it is, I don't know, the SQL part, or someone who's best at standing up a VM, or, you know, best with Docker. Whatever it is that is in your team you're trying to resolve and you need, they will know who's best at doing that and who's weak at doing it, and they can assign the task appropriately. Make the task short and within the team's kind of skill set. So don't give them a million and one things to do. Just give them, right, this is what we're looking for you to do, but if you can just go off and do that bit for me, and let me know when you've done that so I know where we are in, the, in the, the, the chain of sorting things out. If you give them a whole list of things to do, you as a team leader have no idea whether they're struggling with the first item or they're nearly finished. So if you give them, like, yeah, there you go. There's, there's, this is what we're aiming to do. This is what I need you to fix, but do that bit for me. Let me know you've done it. It just be a, you know, a, a quick note on Slack. Could be an email, could be a quick phone call, bash on the door, say, you know, oh, wait, John, I fixed it. It's not a race. Don't think, well, we need to get this done quickly. I'm going to do it as quick as I possibly can. Because if you do race, you'll make a mistake. We're human, we're fallible, we make mistakes. And it could be why you're in this situation to start with. So take your time, nice, calm, methodical. Go through it nice and gently. Complete your tasks as well as you can. Don't delay them. If you can't complete it, this is why I'm saying the team leader must make sure that they only give out small snippets of the task. Let them know what the whole task is, but small snippets, so they can see if that person is struggling with the task. If they come back a few minutes later and say, I've done that. Oh, excellent, there you go. Actually, before you do that bit, can you go and help you know, Simon over there because he's a bit stuck, um, and I know you know how to do that. So you can, so you can reassign them, sort it out, get the problem sorted quickly. Consider overload. If you see someone still there at 10 o'clock at night, bash them around the keyboard because they're struggling. Yeah, consider the fact that actually they're, they're a bit overloaded. They've got too much on at the moment. They need to sort of, you know, switch off, go and have a drink. And the R, the really, really important bit is review. It's a bit everyone forgets. It's a bit at the end. We've assigned the task to fix the problem. Yes, just go to the pub and have a beer. No, review. Did we actually fix the problem? Is it resolved? Is it fixed? Do we have more time? Actually, we, we said we, we, we've got until Tuesday to fix this, or we've got an hour to fix it, or we've got 10 minutes to fix it, or we've got five minutes to fix it. We've still got three minutes left. Let's see if it was the right decision. Did we did diagnose the problem again? Has the problem gone away? Actually, no, it hasn't. We've still got this edge case over here. 
Um, okay, well, what options have we got to fix that? And your options would have changed by then because you would have started to fix parts of the problem. So go back around the loop. Is it still a good decision? Are we still going down the right path? Don't be scared to change. I see this so often in teams that I work with when we go through this. It's the fact they're scared to change their, their ideas. We've gone down this path, and it's nearly always the team lead that is scared to do this. So if you're a team lead in your department for your company, don't be scared. Say, actually, you know what, guys, girls? I've got it wrong. We've gone down the wrong path. Let's change. Let's do this over here. Or, you know, and if you're in a team and the team lead is lively, you're wandering you down the wrong path, stand up and point it out. Trust me, they'll thank you for it later. They may not say it to your face. They may, oh, I, you know, I'm not talking to you and that. But they'll, think, they'll go home that night and think, thank God they stood up and sorted it out for me because otherwise we would have been in really big trouble. Yeah, because they're human. They're fallible. We all are. So, and the earlier you admit to a mistake, if it was you that made the server fall over and crash, you know, stick your hand up. Yeah, I did that and this is how I did it. Because that will help with the diagnosis, help with the option generating. If they know, if the whole team knows what happened and why. If you kind of hide behind your desk, because indeed. So this is T-Dodar. This is what we use day in, day out, no matter what the situation is, from bags, um, baggage belt systems failing to engine failures, bird strikes, catching Pete Burkill with his minute to decide what to do before they, they hit the grounds. This is what we use. It's a great tool. It's tried and tested um, in battle as well. It's, uh, it's brilliant. But the really, really important bit, you know how long it took me to work out how to do that on PowerPoint? <laughs> review, review, review. And if you didn't get it, review again. So this is my office. That's where I sit. You can see perfect practice makes perfect. If you're sitting there or you're sitting back in your office doing whatever it is you do day to day, and it all goes horribly wrong. You know, hopefully you'll remember the t Dodar model and how you're going to do it. Now I'm aware that I've got, what time do we finish this? 20, 25. Got 25 minutes left, have we? Yeah, okay. So hopefully we've got uh, time to, to whiz through this. So it's a bit of a challenge. It's a foggy day at Heathrow. So we're somewhere down here now. Yeah. Um, it's foggy at Heathrow. The reason I know that that's where the Houses of Parliament are is because the thing that really clears fog really quickly is hot air. Houses of Parliament, lots of hot air, so it clears the fog great. So, um, yeah, you're at Heathrow, it's foggy, and you've got 15 minutes um, to make a decision. Can I just check if, how long we've got left? If you don't mind. So what will your team do? So if you can get into little teams, you know, however you want to split it up, but if we can try and keep it to only, say, four teams, that'd be great. So I think we split down the aisle that way, and the back half and the front half. If you can just get together. So 25. Okay, cool. No, what? 25 past, so I have 25 minutes. Absolutely. 25 past, right, okay. Cool. So we get in teams, move around, um, grab pen and paper, and this is the situation you've been dealt like I said earlier. So the scenario, it's 4.30 in the morning, it's Helsinki, it's dark outside. The pickup at the hotel was at 3.30, so your alarm call is just before three o'clock that morning, and you're flying back to Helsinki. Yeah, so you're a little bit jaded, a little bit tired, yeah. 150 passengers boarded in for a full flight, with really high club load, that's the people to pay a bit more for the, the bigger seats at the front. So you're completely full. I put this in, checks complete, so you don't have to worry about the aircraft setting it up. The day that this happened to me, we had a, an engineer in the flight deck, we had a small technical problem we were trying to resolve as well, which added to the situation and made things a little bit more complicated. We're in London, as you see, it's thick fog. The weather report you have in front of you says it's going to last until around midday. Yeah, so, and they're never right. The Met Office is always wrong. No one works for the Met Office, do they? No? Good. Air traffic control advise you have a slot of 14, of 4.50. Yeah, so we'll, we'll give it 10 minutes. Um, a slot is basically your earliest airborne time. You're allowed to go five minutes before or 10 minutes after. So you've got a 15 minute window to get wheels off the runway. That's when your time is. Uh, if you can't make that, just, you miss your slot. You need to apply to Central Flow Management in Brussels for a new one. And they could give you one sometime this afternoon or in five minutes time. You don't know. TRM, which is turnaround manager, this is the person you quite often sit here throw wearing a red cap or you know, down route, they come in with a paperwork and stuff like that, big fish jacket. 
and headphone things. Captain, Captain, the, uh, the baggage system's failed, and uh, the engineers, I've called them, they're on the way, but um, I think we've only got about half the bags. I don't know yet. I'm going to go and see the loaders and see what's going on. Um, that still need to be delivered to the aircraft side and put on. What are you going to do? That's a brilliant answer. I like that. Yeah, he's cased his chimp already. He's done that, hasn't he? So, yeah? Okay. What are you going to do? Not a lot by the looks of it. So, <laughs> let's start by getting into little teams and talk about it. I gave you the T-Dodo model. Have a think. Scary, this inclusion bit, isn't it? Getting together. Make friends. flow management for you and they'll give you an estimated slot which is when they expect you to be given a new one it's never that it's always later than that so they've given you a new slot estimated at 0800 bear in mind it's still 4 30 in the morning so it's a long long way away so there you go how's the sorry how bad we well, can always land because oh. the aircraft can auto land um, so yeah you can land but the reason they have flow management if you imagine going along the m25 doing 180 mile an hour, because that's what the speed we land at, and you're looking for junction 11 to exit, because that's where you want to go, you're not really going to see it, are you? So you're going to slow right down as you approach to look for it. And that means we spend longer on the runway, because we spend longer on the runway, the aircraft that's normally 40 seconds behind you, that's going to land, can't land, because you're still on the runway looking for the exit. That's the whole reason the flow gets stretched out, because you spend more time on the runway. So they give us night vision goggles, we'll get off really quickly, but it costs money, doesn't it? So there you go. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the reason you get the slot delay, is they look at not just when London can next fit you in, but when all the air traffic control zones on the way can fit you in. So they look at the, that's why they're called central flow management, they look at the flow of aircraft around Europe. So I look at, actually, the Heathrow might be out to set you at 7 o'clock, but the air traffic control guy that sits in Paris is really busy then, so he can't deal with you, so they push you all back. So... more information has come through. You've asked what the aircraft's doing today. So you've sent a message to uh, Mum back at Heathrow and said, pretty pleased you can tell me what the plane's doing today. You get a printout of what the aircraft's movements are. And it's doing six flights a day, so it's a busy aircraft. Most of the short haul aircraft do six to eight flights a day. Most of them are all full, we're 150 passengers. It's just leading up to Christmas. Everyone wants to go home or go and see family. So make that what you want. A bit more info, I'm just moving it along a little bit quicker, just so we've got more time for questions and a bit of fun right at the very end. Cabin crews is coming with your cups of tea, you want to hand them over to us. Ah, oh, Captain, by the way, we've got um, a group of 12 gold card holders, the businessmen, off to London, and they're asking for the quickest way to London. You don't know which train it is they can get from Heathrow to, to wherever it is, I can't remember where it was, they were going now. So the cabin crew is still none the wiser, because they're busy sorting the passengers out, so at this point we told the cabin crew what was going on. Oh, really? I want to go home, huh? date my boyfriend and stuff like that, so, um, yeah.
Sorry? Don't know. We knew as much as that. Um, on long haul flights, yes. On short haul, they're all kind of bundled in together. Um, purely because it's just the way the plane's designed. But on long haul flights, the, the first bags tend to go in a special because there's more of them. So they go in a bin of their own. But on short haul flights, there may not be any, any club passengers. So we don't separate it out, really. Oh, OK. Yeah. I like your thinking. <laughs> Bit more info. I've forgotten his name, but he comes from the back of the aircraft. Come in, our Captain. Uh, I've heard the fact that we might be delayed because of this baggage problem. There's a really big group of teenagers at the back, and uh, they're giving a performance at the Royal Albert Hall um, tonight. And uh, yeah, I just want to let you know, just in case it was their stuff that was missing. So uh, TRM was in the flight deck at the time and says, uh, I think I haven't seen any band shaped equipment, I haven't seen any big boxes, so maybe it's part of the, the kit that's missing. Another bit of info, the turnaround manager's just got a phone call from the engineer saying it's going to be at least 30 minutes, one of the motors was burnt out on the baggage belt that feeds the bags out from underground, and uh, yeah, we've got to get a motor, it's going to take at least 30 minutes. At least. At least, yeah, that's what they said. We had 20 minutes, but I'm, short, I'm cutting a bit shorter because I'm a, aware of the time we've got today. Yeah, 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 it was 20 minutes, yeah. I don't know. Did you start a watch? <laughs> I'm moving it along, yeah. So uh, we've got about two and a half minutes left. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah, basically before we have to make a decision on what we're going to do. Yeah. Sorry? Not at the moment, no. They, do, they reconcile the baggage um, as it's being loaded, but they won't get that report until the aircraft's pushed back on stand, off stand. So they, they kind of know what bags are on board because they're buzzed. And if that is, if the, the barcode reader says that we've got more bags than we should have, or we've got a bag that isn't in the computer system, it tells them instantly, but otherwise they reconcile it afterwards. So. How long is the for? two hours, two and a half hours, isn't it? Yeah. The A team at the back there have asked how many flights Helsinki that day. There was four. And just to add insult to injury, you're just sitting there thinking about what's going on. And it started to snow outside. It's Helsinki. It's winter. It does that. Um, and it's, you, you call an air track and try in the tower and say, yeah, this, this snow wasn't on the weather report. So, oh, yeah, it's a storm coming in from the north. Yeah, it looks like it's going to dump a bit more snow than the uh, weather. There's a new ATIS, which is the Air Terminal Information Service, which gives the weather. There's a new updated ATIS if you want to grab it. And yeah, it said that it was going to snow quite a lot. Um, to de-ice an Airbus A320 takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah, we've got to go in a minute. Got a microphone. Microphone. That one there, yeah? Is it on? Yeah, right. You'll see when I need it. Time's up, guys. What do you decide? Don't shout it out. It's an even better idea. What's your PA to the passengers going to be? Who is the team leader over here? Because I like your hair. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. So we decided to go. 
Um, and, well, the PA to our pas passengers. She just read the instructions, so yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah. So, unfortunately, there's been a fault with the baggage uh, moving thing. It's got a burnt out engine. Um, so, uh, there will be some baggage left behind. However, we will endeavour to get this to you as soon as possible. We had to move because otherwise uh, you would be extremely late. I okay. think I'd do it better then. You'd do it better, okay. Think, yeah. You don't get a second chance. <laughs> They're all panicking now, so oh, bugger, I hope it's not me. <laughs> Who's team leader over here then? Who was nominated team leader? Who started the stopwatch? <laughs> oh, you did, didn't you? Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty certain you heard, I, I heard you say what time it was. There you go. Yeah, what time it was. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, there's been a problem with the baggage loading system. Unfortunately, some bags have not been loaded. Uh, we can't be certain which ones they are. Um, we are close to our slot. If we miss this slot, we'll be delayed by a number of hours. So we made the decision, the hard decision to actually um, make leave on this slot and we will um, bring your bags as soon as we can on a subsequent flight. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do this with the NHS, with the doctors and nurses. We go in uniform as a group of us that go along. We, we hand out our, our cap and uh, whoever's wearing the cap, because it gets moved around by the doctors now, nearly always the nurses are wearing the cap. And uh, yeah, it's like if they've got the cap on, they get the microphone. It's like, there you go. Who's team leader back here? Oh, you've nominated one. Excellent. There you go. Yeah, just so oh, okay. my best pilot voice. You can do, yeah. It'd be really good, yeah. <laughs> and you're a fan of Top Gun, so we know you're, you're into planes, so. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, just a quick update from the flight deck here. Uh, we're pretty much ready to go here, and uh, we are just closing up the doors and... Uh, preparing ourselves for departure. Uh, unfortunately, you might notice that the uh, baggage uh, va uh, the baggage delivery is not quite completed. Uh, some of your bags will be uh, left here in Helsinki, and we'll hopefully be able to get them uh, over to London by the end of the day. Uh, we wish you a safe flight, and we will be departing in a few minutes. Excellent. That was good. I like that one. Right, who's, who's over here that's going to do it? You're pointing back that way, so it's got to be you then, isn't it? <laughs> So yeah, we decided to leave the right, team manager. Uh, yeah, pretty much from the same reason we didn't want to wait too much. I, I can't make a, a, what's called, what it's called a pilot voice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> even before because I never quite understand what they're talking about. <laughs> We've still got the croissant stuffed in the back of our throat. That's what yeah. it's on. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, oh. sometimes I understand Perry. We'll be in Turin two minutes. Okay. So yeah, we decided to leave because all the other options seem to be uh, like um, bigger cost for the company and for uh, like for the image of the company itself. Like yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. <coughs> we turn that off now. Thank you. So you all decided to go. You all decided to leave. You all decided to leave the bags behind. You all decided to tell the passengers. Now think about that for a moment. If you're a passenger on that flight, and you've just been told, we're going anyway, as was said at the front, yeah, the other options are going to cost the company a lot more money, how would you feel? Go on, be honest. Go on, speak up. How would you feel? It happened to me in Finland, and I felt very confused because the Finnish people were just shouting every time because they speak Finnish. Okay, and you didn't know. You was like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, telling the passengers before you push back, I think you would have had a riot on your hands. Hey, where's my bag? Oh, I'm not going. If I haven't got my bag, I'm going on holiday. It would have been hell for the cabin crew. Poor cabin crew have to deal with this. Yeah. So what we did, what we decided to do was go. Leave the bags behind, as you guys did. We made a perfectly normal passenger dress for the passengers. Welcome aboard this flight going to London. He's right there. It's a bit foggy in London. You notice it's starting to snow here in Helsinki. We're going to push back, hopefully get out of uh, Helsinki before the snow settles and we have to de-ice. 
We're going to make our route towards uh, London. We'll give you an update a little bit later of our time of arrival into London. Because of the fog, there's probably going to be some extra holding delays in towards London here throughout the day. Sit back, enjoy the movie, enjoy your meal, and I'll switch a bit later on. Thank you. And that's what would have happened. So that would have been a, a PA that I would have made on the day to them effects. So we got airborne, flying towards Helsinki. Spoke to, uh, to um, mum, as we call, office back at, uh, at Heathrow. What bags are missing? What passengers? And they don't give names. We only ever go by seat number for data protection rules because anyone can get an airband radio and listen. And they sent up a, 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 a text message, basically, to the aircraft and ACARS that listed all the seats that had missing bags. It turned out that most of the bags that were missing were the band equipment at the back because they come, what they failed to tell us in Helsinki, that it was the outer gauge baggage system that had broken, not the normal passenger baggage system. So it was all the outer gauge, so the, the trumpet and the trombone and all that sort of stuff. It was missing. So we knew this, so we gave it to the guys at the back of the aircraft, said, right, it's mostly your lot. He went and found the, the group leader for the band and said, by the way, you know, um, your bags haven't made the flight. They're booked onto the later flight, which is at midday. When they arrive in London, where would you like the bags taken, or are you going to wait for them at Heathrow? Actually, we're Royal Albert Hall. If you could deliver them there, it'd be great. Okay, let's come back. Back in the flight deck, we got that message. We spoke on the radio, it was a bit close to London now, so we could got radio contact and said, the missing baggage is for the, uh, the seat groupings, and we gave them the range. Can you arrange for them to be taken to their final destination tonight, which is the Royal Albert Hall? Excellent. Got there, everyone was happy. Yeah? The, I went back with my cap on, and as I do, stand by the door and say goodbye to 150 people. Goodbye, thank you, goodbye, thank you. Got to um, the, the band lot, they were getting off. They were the happiest people I've seen in a long time. And this wee little young girl, she must have been 14, 15, and she plays that big, is it the oboe? The, is it the oboe? The big? No, cello, that's it, sorry, cello. She plays that. I mean, how she lifts the thing, I don't know. She was over the moon because it's now being hand delivered for her. So she hasn't got to take it on the underground. She hasn't got to worry about it on the bus. It's being taken for her. She was over the moon. She's ecstatic. So everyone got off happy. So you can see a framework like TDODAR isn't just used for when we have an engine failure and it all goes pop, bang, whiz. We have a lightning strike. It can be used in any situation, like you guys have just used there to solve a situation about baggage equipment and a bit of time pressure that's added in. Um, you know, we had an engineering issue as well, which added to the problems, um, which, thank you, we got resolved and we got underway. So that is me. That is my job when I'm not crunching code. I get to fly a plane around the world and get to visit the world. I'm mindful of the fact there's only a few minutes left, but if anyone's got any questions, I'm here today and all day tomorrow. Feel free to come and find me. But if you've got any now, shout them out. If not, we'll go and grab coffee. No? Thank you. Just so you know, I thought ahead, sorry, I thought ahead and thought the time is nothing else. I've taken all the red and yellow stickers away, so can I put green in the box? <laughs> Brilliant, thank you very much, thank you.